So, can I ask you when you guys first got this house? Uh, it would be, I think, like March or April 1993, I think it was, uh, we moved here. Mitch, our old guitarist, kind of scoped it out, um, just due to the size of it, really. There was four of us, you know. I was living just up the road with a few friends. So I moved out briefly for reasons I can't remember, I think. I think when, when Danny our drummer moved over, I think it got a bit claustrophobic in old days, but this is like quite a big house, and uh, yes, I'm 93. Me, Danny, Jesse, uh, Mitch. When various members left and stuff, it got restructured to like just me and Danny's place, you know. Good for me, well, Danny as well, obviously, while he's in the country, but good for me because all my records and geeky stuff, you know, there's no space for that at the, at the, at the family home, shall we say. Two or three doors down from this house, there was a, we met a few friends. They, they kept on hearing us play Dead Can Dance or Cobb Dead Twins. I'm like, who are these... Who are these who were these long-haired nutcases who moved in up the road who were playing this really good music, then we became friends. You know, the gardens were connected because the fences weren't there. Um, and we had pear and apple trees, so I think they used to come and nick my pears. But, um, so they, they would come around and then just like we'd go out. We, it was in the 90s, so we, you know, we, would, we were going out partying every night. Everything going on in Birmingham. We would go out to Costamongers which was the main sort of drinking heavy metal pub at the time. Um, a place called the Pen and Wig, which is now Scruffy Murphy's now. You just meet your friends, um, and we'd go out gigging, and we'd just come back here. There was a, a, a bar called Tracines on the Monday night. Disco place, and I think I, think I bumped into Pop, the guys from Pop Lee itself, and Ned's Atomic Dustbin one night. And almost, uh, I remember falling on top of the... the Graham from Poppies. I thought I'd killed him, but I didn't. So that was Monday night. Tuesday would be Costa Mungo's Techno Tuesdays down at Digbeth Institute, which is now the O2 Academy. Wednesday would be like Costa Mungo's. And of course there'd be gigs happening at the Hummingbird, which would be, was the O2 Academy for a while. So you various friends, you know, you, you, you were just a uh, multitude of friends that we hung out with, like Benham's of Benediction or Triple Fix or ball throw sometimes they would come back you know and just hang out and that was kind of our vibe you know really you know because you could always go until about two o'clock in the morning even with the gigs on and stuff so one night james addiction might be playing two nights later sonic youth would be playing or nirvana or something like that we'd be plugging the guest list going down and hanging out and having fun and yeah it was it was, it was a lot of fun there was the bed there was the tv the blocky tvs that we used to have back in the day lots of videos lots of cds and we all had our room, you know. Living room would be a bit chaotic. I mean, this isn't really organised, but it was way more organised than it was. Lots of memorabilia. There'd be posters all just randomly put on the wall because, you know, we always come back from a tour and we just we used to stick them straight up. It wasn't uh, ultra messy, messy, but it was, you know, it was pretty, you know, it was kind of Young Ones-esque, you know. I mean, there was no, like, holes in the walls, nothing like that. But, um... We were young, you know, so it was like you get up and have something to eat and go out and rage and come back and then all we'd rehearse during the day. So we lived and breathed what we were doing. For me, I mean, you know, it, just, it can be cliche, but I mean, I come from a small village and I had my, I, I didn't have many friends. I didn't, they counted the friends I had. But me, Jesse, Mitch and Danny, we, we were family. So we were, we were like brothers, you know, so you get to know each other. I mean, it doesn't work for everybody, I don't think. I don't think Barn could have... Moved in with us because we were just so fucking nutty. And I think at that, at that time, Barn was going through a period where he wasn't really drinking. Um, he moved to London. But for us, you know, I mean, Danny was always the, the most sensible out of, out of... It was me, Jesse and Mitch, who were always getting up to no good and falling over the fence. You know, we'd get some fish and chips, and I'd fucking fall over outside. And Jesse would be laughing because, you know, covered in fish and chips, that kind of vibe, you know. But uh, it was after gigs, you know. I mean, especially about yeah, the, the old days, because those were Americans, they'd be calling home. You get the phone bill, you're like, who the fucking hell's called this for like 30 quid and 40 quid? And we have to go through the green and red pens and work out who's, who's paying what, you know. On my 30th birthday, a couple of my friends come back. I think Jeff was here, Lee was here. I think I called up the electric gas board because they, they power cut. I said, do you have a power cut on my 30th birthday? I was trying to play on the cardiacs or something like that. And I couldn't watch the thing. I said, when are you going to get it sorted? Because it's totally pitch black, you know. Next door, there's a classic tale. 
Um, I don't know when the hell it was. Uh, Nick Barker was down here recording with Cradle of Filth, uh, the third album, and a few of my other friends. Yes, he was upstairs with his girlfriend. And I think there, was, there was probably about ten people in there in my bedroom, and we were just uh, singing on the Saxon. Of course, four or five in the morning, you know, and Jesse's coming down in his in his in his, in his, uh, his nineteen get with you know, his night road, whatever you would call it. I don't know. And you're going, what the hell are you guys doing? You know, and I think Barker, Nick Barker's voice was so hoarse. You know, that's what he did. Yeah. And that's now your little studio room. Little studio room where I yeah, sort of uh, put ideas down for a dark sky or anything really. You know, upgraded stuff. I got, got, got a bigger desk now, so I can hopefully start. You know, recording proper, uh, they say, not so much properly, but I can, uh, you know, put uh, more intricate things down as opposed to what I was doing before. More guitar things, really, because the synthesizer stuff, uh, you can kind of do that just on the laptop as it was, but a lot of guitar things I, I want to kind of mess with over sounds, which I haven't been able to do. So it's kind of my, my escape pod down here, really, you know, which I kind of need, <laughs> I guess. Well, you know, I've got my games consoles, some of DVDs, I have my, my reasonably large-esque Japanese monster toy collection and uh, got some Daleks. During COVID, I felt the need to possess Daleks again because I was obsessed with the Daleks when I was, when I was like six or seven. And uh, <laughs> I think I drove to Bristol together and my, my wife was like, do you really need these Daleks? I'm like, well, yeah, I do. I desperately need them for some reason, so I had six. And so, yeah, it's kind of all in there. And it's, I like it because you sit there and you get like a... It's not just the toys or the... It, it reminds me of particular times. You know, when I was doing something or... A lot of memories within this house because of the, of the band and the friends, you know, and Jesse's not with us anymore, but... So a lot, a lot of memories I come here to think sometimes. And I think that's just as important as doing something, thinking, really. It tends to accumulate lots of stuff. I mean, I've just remembered it, that there's a small case I'm going to open up with a bunch of old laminates in there. You just tend to collect all this memorabilia. You know, it's... I don't know. It's interesting. Time goes by quicker than you f- you find these things and you go, wow. Especially with the, with the book, because, of course, I'd seen the photos around forever, but you just kind of forget about them. And then when you have to pull them out again, and you go, oh, wow, this is like 30 years ago. And you're younger and think, and you go, God, that was that tour or this or that. Strangely enough, I remember the majority of the the snapshots very vividly. It suddenly dawns on you that, you've been, that I've been doing this for a long time. You know, in 1955, and I was 19 when I joined Napalm, and... Even before then, but I'm, I'm very happy. I'm very proud about it. You know, I'm nursing some sort of, you know, older wounds now. Wish they would go away. But um, generally, um, I am. I mean, it's it's. We've done a lot in a in a in a in a, in a well, not a short space of time, but it's gone by very quick. So I mean, I'm quite happy and privileged, I think.